Good morning, everyone, and good evening, good night to Kevin. So Kevin Murphy is our keynote speaker. He's currently a research scientist at Google Mountain View, California. He works on AI, machine learning, Bayesian inference, vision, natural language understanding. So some of you might, many of you might already know him from the popular machine learning textbook, machine learning probabilistic perspective. And there's two new versions of the 2022 book and 2023 versions have come out recently. So before joining Google in 2011, he was an associate professor with tenure of computer science and statistics at University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada. Before starting at UBC in 2004, he was a postdoc at MIT, got his BA from Cambridge, master's from UPenn, PhD from Berkeley. He's published over 120 papers in refereed conferences, journals, three textbooks. The 2012 book was also awarded the Degroot Prize, the best book in the field of statistical science. He is also the co-editor-in-chief of JMLR, the Journal of Machine Learning Research from 2014 to 2017. So it's an honor, it's a privilege to have Kevin with us online. So we welcome him and we now look forward to his keynote. So, so for the online folks who are there on Zoom, you can directly unmute yourself and you can ask questions. For the physically attending audience, you can just raise your hands and one of the TAs will run the mic up to you. Right. The, so. I think Kevin is going to be talking about Bayesian bandwidths. You might find this very interesting, especially given the context that the previous speaker had on recommended systems. Over to you, Kevin. Look forward. Great. Thank you for the invite. Um, it's a great honor to present to you all. Um, I'm going to try sharing my screen um, and switch tabs. So let's just see if this works. Um, OK. Can you see my title slide? Yes, you can see your slides. Great. So I can't see any of you now. So um, if there's a question, just just call it out. Um, yeah, so I'm going to give an overview of um, Bayesian decision making in an online context. Um, and I, I looked at some of the speakers that you've had earlier in the summer school. I know that Professor Batra has been teaching you some Bayesian methods. So in my opinion, the, like the killer app for being Bayesian is when you want to make decisions under uncertainty and you need to trade off uh, sources of information that you might gather to try to reduce uncertainty um, so that you can make decisions that might have different risks and rewards, right? So this comes up in health, in finance, in recommender systems, self-driving cars, active learning, experiment design, like all over the place. This is very foundational. So, um, the main model that people use in this literature is the Markov decision process. Have you gone over this yet already or not? I'm not hearing anything. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a bunch of yes from the, from the audience. Oh, okay. So I'll just go quickly then to define notation. So we have states 
S um, that evolve over time, and this could be just some vector representing, you know, what people are currently watching on YouTube or whatever, um, or the time of day and the state of the economy. And then um, there are actions that the agent can perform that might be to recommend an ad or a video or to, you know, increase inflation or decrease inflation. Sorry, you can't increase inflation. You could increase the interest rate, right? That's sort of the lever that governments have. Um, and then there's some reward, which is what the environment gives back to the agent after an action is taken. And so the reward is, let's say, a random variable that's sampled from some distribution. And that reward distribution depends on the state that you're in and the action that you took. And then after you take an action, the world evolves into some new state that depends on the previous state and the previous action that you just took. So the two main things you need to specify are the transition model, how the world works, and the reward model, which specifies kind of what you, uh, what things you would like to happen versus not happen. And then you need to solve for the policy, which is a rule that tells you what action to take in each state so that the goal is to maximize the sum of expected reward. So I'm assuming you've all heard this phrase before. So at every step, you get a reward for an action that you did. And let's suppose you're, you know, you're a government and you're trying to control the economy. You know, you're, you're tweaking the interest rate lever up and down. So that's your action space. And then you observe, you know, the unemployment rate, let's say, um, or the cost of food. Um, and your reward function is some combination of those things. And you're trying to maximize reward. So, you know, keep people fed <laughs> and employed and happy and so on. So it's a very difficult thing to do. So at each step, you get these rewards and you want to say, on average, I want to make the rewards as high as possible. Okay, so that's the goal. Um, and obviously the economic example is a little um, extreme because <laughs> uh, the world, the, you know, ec economies are quite complicated, but you can imagine simpler versions like a robot that you're trying to steer, for example, or, you know, a YouTube recommender system where you're trying to control the control actions of what videos to show. And the rewards in that case would be whether the person liked the video. Did they click on it? Did they watch it to the end? Um, did they buy any of the products that were advertised in the middle of the video? So you get to define the reward function um, that sort of specifies the task. And then everything else is unknown and needs to be learned. OK, so I'm going to um, talk about some basic methods for tackling these decision problems. And I'm going to spend most of my time focusing on a simpler K specialization of this problem known as a bandit problem, um, which is less is simpler than the full RL problem. Um, and we have a paper last, well, I guess it was, I don't remember if it was published in, I think it was AI Stats 21. Um, anyway, we have a published paper um, that I'll go into some detail on, not a lot of detail. And then I'm going to present some very recent work that's in progress right now. Uh, with one of my interns where we try to ex expand some of these ideas to the full RL case. Okay, and you can interrupt me anytime with questions. So um, this is the special case that I mentioned, bandits. So bandits are, are like a Markov decision process, except at every moment in time when you take an action, the next state's chosen randomly, independently of what you did. It's just the world presents itself with a state, which is often called a context. And then you have to decide what to do, and you take an action, you get a reward, and then it repeats. And the states are all, um, they might evolve over time, but we don't model that. We just think of them as just random presentations. So they, I'm sure some of you have seen a figure like this before that tries to explain where this word bandit comes from. So in English, the phrase one-armed bandit is often used, or well, I don't know if it's often used, it's sometimes used to describe these things, slot machines that you see in casinos. So you can imagine that each, each slot machine if you pull the lever, it returns money at a certain rate that's unknown. So some of them are like what well, they call them loose slots, right? They pay out a lot of money and some of them are very tight and they don't give much reward. So if you are a player in a casino, you have to figure out where which machine you should play on to make as much money as possible. So that's why it's called a multi-armed bandit. And now, um, so you, each of the actions corresponds to like pulling a lever on one of these machines. So you've got, if there are K machines, there are K possible actions. So that's a finite set of actions. We could have a real valued action vector, which is like, you know, the interest rate in the economy or, you know, the speed of a robot. So that's, um, we can choose what the action space is. And um, the reward space is similar to before, like for every action you take, it's the reward that you get depends on the state that you're in. So that's the context. So if I pull the lever on this machine, when the machine is full of money, then I'm gonna like maybe make a lot. 
but if it's if I've emptied the machine of all its coins, <laughs> then the state has changed from like full to empty, and now I won't get anything, right? So um, the the value of an action will depend on the context. Okay, so that's a multi-arm bandit. So this is a mathematical abstraction um, that's simpler than the MDP case, but still covers a lot of problems of interest. Um, you know, for like advertising and, and clinical trials and so on. Okay, so here's some concrete examples, some diving into a little bit more notation. So the, the really all we have to do is specify the reward function, which defines the problem. And then we have to compute the policy, which is what the algorithm that tells you what to do. Um, so we can have a very simple Gaussian bandit that says for each action A, there's a different mean invariant. Um, so some of them have high, some of these arms have high payoff, some have low payoff, and the variance might differ. We can have a Bernoulli bandit where each arm has a different payout rate. So this is just a probability. So there should be a sigmoid here. Um, if theta is a probability between zero and one, this is well formed, but I really meant it to be a sigmoid. Then we can have contextual bandits. And the only difference is now we have features or states as input as well. So the reward, let's say a Gaussian contextual bandit would be this kind of form for the reward function. It just says that the re expected reward is a linear function of the state or the context. And the variance might be a constant depending on the arm, or it, this could be input dependent as well. You can have logistic regression contextual bandits. So these are very widely used in industry for modeling like click through rate on ads. So this is the probability you click or not, that's the reward. And then X are the features for the ad and the user and then weight W are the weights or the parameters, right? So this is like measuring how good of a choice is it to show ad A in the context X, right? But these are all linear models. We can make them nonlinear, right? So F can be an arbitrary nonlinear function. And that could be a neural net, for example, could be a decision tree, whatever. It's just some nonlinear function. And it's modeling the expected reward as a function of the state and the action. And then W are the unknown parameters. So these are all different model families, and some of them allow you to solve the problem exactly, and some are harder. Um, more flexible models at the bottom, these neural models are harder to solve, but are more powerful from a representation point of view. Okay, so um, typically, you know, if you have some model and you wanna act, what you, the naive thing to do would be to pick the action that maximizes the expected reward. So this reward function now, this could be it's one of these things, right? It could be a neural net or a linear model. So we assume it's known for the moment. Uh, you can just consider all possible K arms and pick the one with the highest expected reward. So that's being greedy, right? You're trying to get as much reward now as you can possibly get. Um, but there might be uncertainty about what the rewards are for the different actions and the different states, because initially when you walk into the casino, you don't know which one to play, right? You have to do some experiments. So you're going, you can represent your uncertainty about the parameters of the model, and the model here is just the reward function. So the parameters are theta. So we can represent our uncertainty, given the data seen so far, as a belief state, which is just a distribution over the parameters. And so the data at each step of the state action reward, the, the triple. And then every time we act, we get more data, and our beliefs get updated using Bayesian updating. So um, why do you want to do this? Well. It helps you solve this exploration exploitation dilemma that some of you may have heard of. So here's a little cartoon. I'm some robot, and I could, you know, go play on one of the slot machines that has already made me a lot of money. But maybe they just opened a new slot machine in the corner, and I don't know what it does. Maybe it's going to give me gold bars if I pull the handle, and I'll be a billionaire. But maybe it's going to give me, you know, nothing, <laughs> just lumps of coal, something worthless. Uh, so you don't know until you try. So you have to explore a little bit. But when you explore, you're leaving, you know, there's an opportunity cost because you didn't get sort of a guaranteed income from the things that you already know. So you have to do this trade-off between exploring new things and exploiting the things that you already know. So there's several ways to um, tackle this problem. One of the simplest is called the upper confidence bound. So what you can do is you can maintain an estimate of the expected reward for every possible action. Um, this should really be a function of the state as well. I forgot to write that. Um, but if we think of this as you know, a Gaussian bandit, for example, this is just the mean. And then we can have a variance, which is um, representing our uncertainty about that reward. Um, and that uncertainty will go down as we collect more data. 
And then what we can do is instead of just picking the arm with the maximum reward, we can pick the arm with the maximum upper bound on the reward, where the upper, do I have a figure? Yeah. So we can have the um, a Gaussian shape like this. So here are like three different actions, the blue action, um, the red action, and the green action. And the horizontal axis um, uh, is the distribution over rewards for the three discrete actions. So you can see here that the, the red action, um, there's quite a lot of variance and the blue action has even more variance. So if we looked at the one that's the most likely to pay off, it would be action three, because you can see that its mean is the largest, but there's not a lot of variance. Here, there's a lot of uncertainty about action one, right? Its mean is lower, but there's a possibility we're over here in the tail, right? In the high tail. So there's some chance that the, the reward is actually quite large. So what we can do is we can take the mean and we can add some multiple of the variance to get like a, uh, uh, an interval. And you can see that this interval, if we, depending on the scaling factor, for the blue arm is here, which is higher than the red, which is higher than the green. So even though the mean of blue is smaller, if the mean plus the variance is higher. So if we're going to be optimistic in the face of uncertainty, we should pick the blue action. OK, so this is a very um, standard approach. So what you need to do to implement this rule is you have to maintain the mean, but also the variance. So you have to have these first two moments of your model. So basically, if you maintain a Gaussian distribution over the parameters of your model, then you can employ this rule. And there's another thing you can do, which turns out to be easier to generalize, and that's called Thompson sampling. So what you can do is if you have a distribution over your parameters, you can just sample a specific set of parameters from your distribution at each step. And then you can just greedily maximize, pick the action with the maximum reward according to these plug-in parameters. So if you've got some, some variance, then sometimes you'll pick high parameters, sometimes you'll pick low parameters. But on average, what this does is to pick actions in proportion to the probability that they're good. And so this will automatically trade off exploration for exploitation. So initially, when you're uncertain, you're going to pick parameters that are quite broad, and then the expected value might be high or low. But as you get more information, this posterior will become narrower, and this ends up converging to the greedy policy. So this is pretty simple, because all you have to do is update your belief state with Bayes, and then once you've got it, you just sample from it, and then you pick the best action. So that's one reason this is widely used, because it's very simple. So basically, this reduces the whole bandit problem to a Bayes problem. Um, which is good because we kind of know how to solve Bayesian inference problems. And I know that Professor Bartra has gone over this with you because I saw some of his slides. So I think a difference from what he covered is that here in this bandit setting, we're doing the Bayesian updating online as the data streams in. So we want to compute the posterior given all the data. So we're going to have a likelihood for the current piece of data times the prior given all the past data. Right. So this is this base rule. So we assume we've already got this prior which is the posterior from the previous step. And then we have some likelihood function um, that specifies the form of the rewards. And then we have to compute the posterior. So we turn the Bayesian crank. So we just do some algebra and we get the answer. And that algebra will depend on the form of the model. So in some cases, you can write down the solution exactly. Um, and I think you've seen this already. So this is a simple conjugate model where the likelihood is a, this is a Bernoulli bandit. So we've got a binomial likelihood, the probability of n0 successes and n1 failures is given by this. We'll put a beta prior on it. If you multiply the beta prior by the binomial likelihood, you get a beta posterior. So you're just incrementing your pseudo counts with your empirical counts. So this is a very simple closed form equation for a single, you know, updating the probability of heads for a coin, right? So I know you've seen this already. Um, and I think you've probably seen this figure or something similar where maybe we start out with this red prior, we have this black likelihood, and then the posterior is some sort of convex combination of the prior and the likelihood. Um, and eventually this will you know, converge to a spike at the maximum likelihood estimate as you get more data. Okay, so that's very simple, just closed form updating. And if in the context of bandits, we would have one of these for every possible action, right? Because each action has the probability of payout. Um, so we just have one of these beta binomial models for every arm separately. And um, what you can do is you can think about that pictorially. 
So if I have two arms, um, two actions, I'm going to have two distributions, right? So let's suppose I start out with a flat distribution on arm one and a peak distribution on arm two. These are the reward functions. If I take action one in the environment, it might either give me a positive reward or a negative reward. If it gives me a positive reward, I update my belief distribution and I picked action one. This gets updated, right? It went from the prior to the posterior, but the other arm remains the same because I didn't explore it. If I repeat that pick action one again and I get another success, then the shape shifts again and everything else is constant. If I get a failure, then I update this guy. So all I'm doing is I'm just taking actions in the world and I'm updating the appropriate part of my model, right? The part that I just got data for. The parts that I didn't try remain the same because I'm assuming the world is the same. The only thing that's changing is my belief state about the world. Okay, so, um, so this is very simple. It's just counting and adding up numbers, right? Like these pseudo count things here. Um, and that explains its popularity. You can do it also for other conjugate models like a linear regression model, where now you do Bayesian linear regression, which is a little more complicated to write down, but it's still close form. Um, here's a little example where there are three arms and um, uh, the form of the state is this polynomial and these are the coefficients for the three arms. And initially it looks like arm two is the best, right? Because it's highest. But because of this polynomial term with, um, uh, let's see which one wins in the end. Uh, well, because of the form of this parameters, you can look at the shape over time. And eventually arm zero is the best. So if you look at the, um, if you do Thompson sampling on this and you look at the reward that you get for each arm, eventually it'll end up picking the right arm the most. And it discovers that it's uncertainty about the parameters for the blue model go to zero. And the uncertainty in the other arms doesn't necessarily go to zero because it realizes it should stop trying them. Um, so it's sort of irrelevant. You only have to worry about learning about things that matter, right? The things that are good. You don't have to worry about modeling the whole world as long as you know, once you figure out what the best thing is. So that's another example. So these are two simple examples. Bernoulli and Is there a question? Oh, somebody needs to mute. Um, OK. There was a lot of noise on the line. I think it stopped. So. Um, so these were, they were some simple um, linear bandits. We can make them nonlinear. Like I said, this could be a neural network. And the, the, basically the high level problem is the same, right? We wanna represent our uncertainty about the parameters of the reward model. And we're gonna model that uncertainty with a Gaussian and it'll have parameters mu and sigma and it's multivariate. And the key question is if we start with some prior and we get some new data, how do we compute the posterior when the model is nonlinear? Right. So one thing you can do is, so if you do this online with a linear model, you can use the common filter to recursively update your belief state in closed form. And so that's a beautiful algorithm from the seventies. Um, if your model is nonlinear, then you can linearize it using a Taylor series approximation. And that's called the extended common filter. And so this is, this was proposed for training neural networks back in 1989. Um, where the data streams in and you just update your Gaussian approximation to the belief state by linearizing the neural network and applying the Kalman update. I'm not going to go into Kalman today. I don't have time, but it's some, you know, a few lines of math, a few lines of Python or a few lines of Jax. actually. We have a Jax library that does all this. The main problem is that the, um, in the equations that I'm skipping, there's a matrix inversion and the size of that matrix is the sigma matrix. So it's D by D capital D, where D is the number of parameters. And that, you know, for a modern neural network might be in the millions. So this is obviously hopelessly intractable to apply to modern problems. So um, there's a trick, and this is sort of, this trick is the key thing that we leverage in our paper. So it has been observed that, you know, we neural networks are often highly over-parameterized. There are many more parameters than you really need to express the function of interest. So it turns out that you can approximate uh, the weights of a neural network as a linear combination of some low dimensional 
uh, as a point on the low dimensional manifold. So what we can do is we can have some low dimensional basis set A, which are like uh, represented by this 2D plane here. And then we can have some coefficient Z, which is just specify which location in this manifold we are. And the current parameters for the model are just, all we have to do to specify the parameters is to specify the weights, sorry, is to specify the location in the manifold. And this is the low dimensional manifold of size little d. So this is just like little d numbers, maybe a hundred numbers. And then this matrix A is going to map from a hundred dimensional space to the million dimensional space. So as long as we know this basis set, then I don't need to uh, specify a distribution over all of theta. I only need to specify a distribution over Z, which is a small thing, right? So that's going to make everything fast. And we can add some offset term, which is just like the origin of this manifold. So the fact that, so it turns out you can just use a random matrix and you can get pretty good results for reasons explained in, in these papers at the bottom. And here's just a proof by picture of that claim. So here we fit, this is supervised neuro, neuro, supervised learning, no RL for the moment. If we take a MNIST model and fit it with a neural network, an MLP, um, if we specify the parameters to be a random basis set times some learned coefficient Z, as we increase the size of the subspace, then we're approximating the full parameter space more and more closely. But you can see from this plot that the accuracy as a function of subspace dimension goes up very quickly. And you only need a few hundred dimensions to capture like the performance of the full model. So um, this says that we only, you know, we only need a few hundred parameters um, to get the performance that's very close to a, a large neural network. So that suggests that we can be Bayesian about these coefficients as long as we know these initial parameters A. And so that's the trick that we use in our paper. So this is our AI stats paper that I wrote with um, Gerardo Duran Martin and Elena Cara. So what's going on if we think about it in terms of a graphical model is this. So question. we've got these. Can we have a question? Yeah. So, so the yeah. previous slide seemed very promising where we can project the parameters down to sufficiently low space, uh, low dimensional space. But why, mm -hmm. why don't we hear about this or use this approach much more commonly? Well, you, it does leave some money on the table. So you can see there's a gap between the full model, which is the horizontal line, and the model obtained by um, the subspace. So here, well, here the gap's getting close, right? So if we go out to, I think on the right, this is a, this is a CNN on the right. This is an MLP on the left. So um, here we're getting very, very close to the full model. Um, but you have to, uh, this is with a random matrix, we can get even better results if we learn the A matrix. So I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, one problem is the size of this projection matrix D by D, right? So this is the size of your initial model. Let's say it's a million. If you've got, let's say a thousand dimensional subspace, you've got a thousand copies of your model. So it's kind of a cheat really. <laughs> um, so let's say it may be more pragmatically, you have like a hundred dimensions. This projection matrix is, if it's dense, takes a lot of memory. So that's a problem. Now you can use sparse projection matrices or structured projection. Like you don't have to just treat um, the weights as a unstructured blob. You can do this for every layer separately. Um, so I think there's some mileage in this um, that's still underexploited. Um, yeah, I think you you could exploit it more. Uh, here, if A is random and fixed, then um, it's not a linear model, right? We're just creating the parameters. If we want to do, if you want to get, you can get, get away with a much smaller dimensionality, like just in the tens, if you learn this A. So one way to learn the A is take a few steps of gradient descent and then watch the trajectory of the parameters and then fit basically a low dimensional linear manifold to the trajectory of the parameters using PCA. And then once you've got this subspace, you can freeze it and then from then on, you treat A as a constant and you just be Bayesian about Z. So that's what we do. So we allow the agent initially to have, you know, a few trials for free. And then we estimate A based on just SGD on the first few iterates. And then we apply Bayesian inference to this model. So the Zs are um, the coefficients in the low dimensional space. This is a few tens of dimensions. And then they generate the weights of the full network with using this fixed basis vector. And then that generates the reward signal. Here I'm writing it Y, but this might be the reward if it's a bandit. 
Um, and that depends on the parameters and it depends on the state and it depends on the action. And this is a nonlinear model, but we're going to do EKF to get a Gaussian posterior on Z. So that's basically the whole paper. Um, so in a little bit more detail, it looks like this. So we'll have some initial steps some warm up steps, and then we'll do SGD on the first few steps, like I said, and we'll compute the linear subspace on the first on the iterates of the first few parameter vectors. Uh, and then we'll freeze that. And then we start being Bayesian. So this is like a, a fixed cost that we pay up front. Um, then we start running the extending common filter. And then each step, we sample a state, we sample a low dimensional weight vector. We are greedy. We do Thompson sampling with respect to that. We get the reward. We augment our data vector. And then we update our belief state using the new data. And then we repeat. So, um, so that's our algorithm. We called it neural subspace bandits. And we did a whole bunch of experiments that I really don't want to get into um, because it, it would require me explaining all the baseline methods. Um, and I'm just not motivated to do that, but you can ask me later if you want. Anyway, on tabular data from UCI, the Bayesian bandit showdown was based on top of the UCI repository. We do well. Um, everything's pretty similar as you can kind of see. So I don't want to make strong claims that we blow the competition out of the water. You know, to be honest, even simple linear models work very well on this data set. So I don't think there's a lot of headroom on that uh, on that benchmark. Um, so I don't really trust any results that people publish on that benchmark. Um, we did some other experiments. We made a synthetic recommended system example based on the movie lens data set. And there we saw more substantial gains over other methods such as the neural linear method or a fully linear method. Um, and I'm not going to dissect all these results, but basically, you know, our approach is, 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 you know, it's Thompson sampling, right, which we know to be optimal, but even with the approximations that we're making, it still, still performs well. Um, and it turns out, you know, you can look at the performance as a function of the dimensionality. And um, if you're doing a random subspace, you have to go up to a few hundred. If you do this SVD trick, you know, you, you plateau quite much sooner, like a few, like a hundred dimensions. Um, and then after that, it doesn't really help to go much higher, but, which is pretty interesting. But that obviously depends on the model and the, on the data. Okay. Um, so there's a bunch of future work to be done on this. So one would be um, Bernoulli bandits. So they're quite common, like I mentioned in industry. Um, and not just, so if you're, if the reward is binary, like either I clicked on the ad or I didn't, right? That's the canonical example. So in that case, the likelihood function has this form. The F is still the same neural network as before, but we pass it through a sigmoid to get the probability of heads. And that little innocuous change actually makes things much more complicated because it's not a Gaussian likelihood. We can't use the EKF to, um, even whether or not we have the subspace trick that I just discussed, because the EKF makes a Gaussian assumption. But there are a variety of algorithms that relax that. You can use expectation propagation or VI or various sort of common filter-like methods. Um, so we're actually ex planning to explore some of those in the future. Another more substantial change would be to try to learn this projection matrix online instead of that warm-up, having a warm-up phase, like I mentioned. So the warm-up phase is a bit ugly, it's particularly if there's distribution shift, right? the optimal basis set might change. So ideally, we could learn that online. But it's it's a very large vector um, or matrix. And so it's not realistic to be Bayesian about that entire you know million dimensional matrix. So what we can do is we can say, well, look, let's just partition our parameters into A and W. And we're going to do point estimation for the A's. So we're just going to have a maximum likelihood estimate. And most of the parameters will be in this A matrix. And then we're going to be Bayesian about the other ones, W. And this will be a low dimensional setting. So there's many ways to partition our model into A and W. So what we could do is have a neural linear model where the A's represent the parameters of the feature extractor. And then W are just the parameters of the final layer. So that's called the neural linear model because it's a linear model on top of a neural network. And now we can do maximum likelihood training of the neural net feature extractor. And we can be Bayesian about the final layer. And that's actually a very common method that people use. It works quite well. Um, it's quite pragmatic. 
Um, but that's not the only thing you could do, right? We could say, we're gonna have parameters at every layer of our model. And then the stochastic or the, un the things that we're modeling our uncertainty about could be modulating these baseline parameters. These could be layer non-parameters, for example, like in the Bayesian hyper network. So a hyper network is a neural network that generates parameters for a neur another neural network. So you can think of these Ws as being combined somehow with these As to, um, to parameterize the activations of this hidden layer. So you can play all kinds of neural net games, right? This is a modeling choice um, and the right choice depends on the data. Um, but once you've partitioned it this way, then you end up with a state space model where the state has stochastic variables W that evolve over time. And then you have point estimated parameters that also evolve over time. And then together they generate the full parameter vector that generates the rewards given the state. So um, there's a whole bunch of methods for doing online, they call it dual estimation because you have to estimate the parameters and the state at the same time. So there's many methods for dual estimation in state space models that you could apply in this context. So I think that's something we'd like to do in the future. Okay, so I'm gonna, um, I could take any quick questions if there are any about bandits before I give you a little teaser about RL and then we'll wrap. No questions. All right, let me move on then. So um, it's, it's natural. Question. Yeah. Uh, hello. So my name is Pandan. Yeah. I have a question. So uh, how do we decide between typical A-B tests and MAB A-B tests? Like when do we do what? Um, so an A-B test is basically like a two-armed bandit problem, right? Yes, sir. Um, so if you do, I mean, Bayesian A-B, I actually have a section on this in my book. So. Bayesian was my picture of the arm, right? Um, yeah, so you have the standard product that you are already is already in production. And then the trial B is like the new experiment that you launch on the subset of the people. And, um, and you can just use standard bandit methods for A-B testing. It's okay. just, it's strictly more general. There might be some A-B test methods that I mean, because it makes more assumptions, I'm sure there are specialized methods for A-B tests that I'm not familiar with that are more efficient. Um, I do discuss one example in my book uh, where you can compute. So here, like I said, we can do the Bayesian updating analytically. So all of this, all of these equations here, right? Um, but that doesn't give you the optimal policy. But in the A-B testing setting, um, you can actually solve for the optimal policy, like how many trial should you do of your new product B um, until you um, decide whether you want to launch B into the market or go and stick to you know, the existing product A. So you can compute the sample size that you need and it depends, and you look at the data that you perform that you get back. And based on the data that you get back, you can compute a posterior over which is more likely to maximize reward in the future. And as soon as you cross some threshold, you say, aha, I know what the optimal action is, I'm gonna pick that. So you can actually solve that analytically in the case of A-B testing, which you can't do for a general bandit. Um, so there are settings in which that might be preferable. Um, I, yeah, it's called, the example I'm talking about is called, um, mm, okay. what's it called? Test and roll, test and roll, right? So you have two things that you're testing, product A and product B, and then you do it for a, some number of trials until you're sufficiently confident about which one is better and then you roll it out into production. Um, so it might be that the incubant is best and your fancy new you know, Instagram filter is terrible and everyone hates it. <laughs> so you roll back to the old thing, but maybe the new thing is lovely and everyone wants it. So then you switch to that. So that um, I cover in my book, um, but there's lots of A-B testing methods that I, I'm not very familiar with. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. So let me go over a little bit of RL. This is work in progress, so it's more of a more of a teaser. Um, but just to sort of make the point that some of the methods that I discussed can be generalized to the full RL setting. So in the bandit setting, what we were doing, if you recall, is at each step we sample an action or an arm from the posterior um, over actions, right? So this is coming from our belief state about the parameters. Then we pull the arm, we observe some reward, and then we update our belief state about 
the expected reward for each arm and therefore which arm is the best. Right, once we know the reward function, we can figure out what arm, the probability of each arm being optimal. So in RL, we, uh, there's a method called posterior sampling reinforcement learning, which is kind of similar. If you, in the episodic setting, at the beginning of each episode, you sample a policy from your posterior of a policies, and then you execute that policy in, in the environment for a while. And instead of just getting a single reward, you get a trajectory of rewards. So you get a whole sequence of state action reward triples until you hit some terminal state. And then you update your belief state about policies given that trajectory, and then you repeat. So that's the basic idea. And so it's kind of like Thompson sampling, right? You have a distribution of a policies, you sample a policy, and then you exploit it by picking, you're performing greedily according to that policy, collect the data, and you repeat. So um, this was proposed by um, Ian Osmond and Ben Van Roy, and it has various theoretical properties that um, are quite appealing from a sample efficiency point of view. You don't need to do as many trials in the real world as like non-basic methods. But the problem is you have to represent this posterior over the policy. And then once, you, once you've sampled the policy, you then have to optimize it. So both of those are difficult. So um, just in pseudocode, what's going on is like for each episode, uh, we've got some data from the environment, D sub L epsilon. We're going to fit the posterior of, of policies on that data set somehow. We're going to sample a policy from our distribution somehow. And then we're going to run H look ahead steps where we just use that policy in the environment by acting greedily. And then we store all the data from that episode. And then um, we update our posterior and repeat. So this is sort of the RL analog of what we just discussed at a high level. So how are we going to represent the uncertainty over policies. So the idea that we're exploring right now, this is work I'm doing with Chao Chi Wang at Chicago, is that the posterior over policies can be decomposed as the posterior over policies given the model, and then the probability of the model given the data. So the model is the dynamics model of the agent and the reward function. In bandits, we just had the reward function. In RL, we also have a dynamics model. So these can be neural networks, and we model uncertainty about those neural networks somehow. And then this is the policy given the model. So what we do in this work, rather than doing EKF or something like that, some parametric approach, we use a non-parametric approach to represent the posteriors. So we just use a deep ensemble, which I suspect Professor Batra has talked about. Um, so basically, it, to represent uncertainty about the dynamics, we just have a set of different neural net models um, with weights. And then to represent the uncertainty about the policy, for each dynamics model, we're going to have also a set of policies that represent different ways of acting, right? Given that the world has a certain form. Um, and this is just like, you know, doubly nested deep ensembles. So then if we plug those assumptions into our previous algorithm, then what that means is that the trainings, updating the posterior amounts to basically just training our ensemble of models on the empirical data. Sampling model is straightforward. You just pick one at random and then you exploit it. And then um, what we do is rather than just following the policy in the environment, which is very data expensive, we follow the policy for a while to collect some real world data. But since we're doing model-based RL, we can also use our model to hallucinate new data without actually acting in the world. So we have fake rollout data and we add that um, to our data buffer. And then we train the policy on both the real data and the fictitious data. And the reason we don't just use fictitious data from our model is our model might be wrong. So we want to sort of mix in a bit of real world data with a bit of fantasy data from a model. And as our model gets better, we can trust it more and more. But initially, we rely a lot on raw empirical data so that we don't get misled. Um, so here's just a, so a little eye candy to show you that it works, at least in some problem setting. So we're trying low dimensional continuous control problems from the uh, Muchoko benchmark. This is the Walker 2D example. So one of the base uh, state of the art methods is called model based policy optimization, policy optimization. Um, and that's shown in yellow. And then here are some results from, from our method that show significantly better results by virtue of modeling our uncertainty about the dynamics and the policy, and then doing this Thompson sampling method um, to uh, trade-off exploration and exploitation. And you can see that if we turn Thompson sampling off, 
which is shown in green, we get much res worse results than if we use Thompson sampling. So this, I think, is a pretty compelling illustration of the power of modeling uncertainty. And here, you know, we're, we're sort of poor man's base. We're just doing a deep ensemble. We didn't, you know, you could argue that the EKF is fancier, but um, they're both different forms of approximate posteriors. Um, but the point is that we're not trusting our model. We know it's uncertain, and we're going to leverage that uncertainty to do efficient exploration. Um, I don't think these videos will play. Yeah, they won't play. Um, oh, maybe they will. Yeah. Okay, Chaji must have shared it with it. Can you see this thing moving, walking along? See it moving. Yeah, so you've probably seen things like that before. That just gives you an idea of the policy that is learned. Um, so the I think the RL policy is slightly, sorry, they're all RL. The one that does Thompson sampling, it's pretty hard to see actually <laughs> if this is better or not. But um, the baseline is pretty good. It's not like falling over, but it turns out this actually ends up moving faster and it has higher expected reward. Okay, so um, so that's some work that we're that's still in flight, but that was just sort of a teaser of, since actually the last time I presented this work on bandits, um, it was also to some folks in India. It was for the Google Research India conference. And I presented this you know, a couple of months ago and I had a lot of questions from people in the audience saying, oh, how do you do this for RL? So, okay, this is how you do it for RL. Um, or one way. So just to summarize then, in the, in the bandit setting, we saw that Thompson sampling, well, I, I didn't show you, but I asserted that Thompson sampling is near optimal. You can prove it has optimal regret. It's very simple. And basically, if you can solve the corresponding online Bayesian inference problem, then you've solved the bandit problem, right? Um, so that's kind of good news if you, if you like working on Bayesian inference problems. So any um, progress we make in state space modeling can be applied to that setting. And similarly, um, it's not just bandits, actually. So if you want to do online learning of neural networks in non-stationary environments, then you can cast that problem as uh, parameter inference, right, in a state space model, in a non-linear, non-Gaussian state space model. So I think that's a pretty interesting area, something I'm working on a lot right now. For the RL setting, it's a bit more complicated. We can do this episodic tump and something that I mentioned. But now we have three models, right? We've got the neural net dynamics, the reward function, and the policy. So we have to represent uncertainty about all of them. And so in this work, we did a you know a simple approach of using deep ensembles to represent uncertainty, but you know, there may be headroom in other approaches. Certainly people have tried GPs and so on. Um, and but regardless of the method that you use, you know, Bayes is always assuming that your model is correct. So we might have, you know, the optimal posterior conditional on our model, but our model might be wrong, right? Because the real world is difficult to model. <laughs> so you don't want to trust your model too much. Um, so you need to sort of mix in empirical data um, with some with some data from your model. So you want to use your model so that you can be sample efficient, but you, it's a trade-off between trusting your model too much um, and and uh, and therefore breaking and not using it enough and being very slow from a data sampling point of view. Okay, um, so that's all I have. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Oh, this is a little teaser. Um, so you may have heard I'm working on, well, uh, Professor Patra mentioned at the beginning, I have a sequel to my 2012 book, which is now split into two volumes. Volume one's already out um, and available online and in print. And volume two is a draft is online and this will be going to print soon. And volume two covers a lot of the things I talked about today. There's a whole chapter on RL. There's a whole chapter on state-based models. There's a whole chapter on Bayesian neural networks um, and so on. So if you want to understand what I just said, <laughs> um, then you might need to download this and, and, and read some of it. And then you can look at the slides um, a second time. Cool. OK, thank you. Any questions from the audience? So while the audience is being shy, I can sort of ask one question on, on their behalf, I think. So so many of these folks are starting out on machine learning. They're pretty excited about it. But uh, how would you suggest them to get started? So, so on one end, they can see the volum voluminous, you have two books, right? And that, that can be daunting. 
they can see some some blogs which can be pretty noisy on online blogs so how do you suggest uh, people starting out in machine learning to approach to approach studying machine learning well i think my first book is fairly accessible it's it's shorter it's only 800 pages <laughs> but it's not like you need to cover all of that i think um you know some chapters can be skipped and so probably the core material is like only 400 pages and that overlaps with uh you know it 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 overlaps with a lot of content you can find in other books and in blogs and so on um but you know it has the advantage that it's been edited and has contributions from you and some of your other students and we have jack's code so i think one approach that i recommend is to mix you know reading with doing some paper and pencil exercises to make sure you understand the math with some coding where you just try to implement something yourself uh, in Jax or PyTorch or whatever. And then um, you can compare that. Well, you could start by using an off-the-shelf library like sklearn. It's very friendly. Um, but it's also, if you really want to understand it, uh, then it helps to try to re-implement things yourself. And you know, it takes time, but it's a fun, it's a fun journey. Um, so I had a question in case uh, there's nothing from the audience. Yeah. In your last slide, uh, the first point said that uh, yeah, you mentioned that uh, we can optimally solve solve deep bandits using this uh, Thompson sampling and the combination of the reward function. So uh, I was just wondering, I mean, this might be a naive question that, is that a formal notion of optimality? For instance, are you, are you, are you talking about any regret or anything of that sort? Yeah, so it's, it's been shown that Thompson sampling with, an, with the true posterior um, has optimal regret. Um, so, you, you know, in the long run, you can't beat it. In the case of an approximate posterior, which is what we're computing, um, then the bounds are looser. In fact, this is, I, so I'm not an expert on bandit theory or RL theory. So um, a lot of the bandit literature is, is quite theoretical and most of the effort is improving regret bounds, in fact. So in the case of like the neural tangent kernel, effectively what they do is they say, well, once we've learned the kernel, it's a linear model. We know then we could just do Bayesian linear regression. That's optimal and we'll incur, you know, we'll enjoy the, the optimality bounds that follow from standard Thompson sampling. So essentially they sort of ignore the warm up cost of having learned the kernel and then they treat it like a Bayesian problem. That's asymptotically, that's fine, but like that's not, uh, not very efficient in practice. We do compare empirically in, um, in our paper, we compare to neural to the neural tension kernel method. And um, we are more sample efficient, at least empirically, uh, because the neural tension kernel is not particularly good approximation for finite width neural nets. Um, and it's not necessarily a very expressive model family. So people like it because you can prove things, but um, we don't have any proofs of optimality. I mean, we know that the EKF is not optimal, right? Uh, with if you did particle filtering, then with enough particles, you can reach the true posterior. So then you you could just sort of reuse off-the-shelf optimality claims and say you're being optimal. But again, that's kind of vacuous because it depends on how you know. We know that the quality of importance of particle filtering depends on your proposal distribution, and the variance of the weights will factor in. So that seems quite hard to quantify in general. Um, I suspect there are, you know, I think there is a literature where people analyze special model families where, you know, there may be non, they're not exact because otherwise it's sort of trivial, but maybe you can, I think you can, actually I'm pretty sure Ian Osborne has results now that I think about it, um, where the regret bound is stated in terms of the KL divergence between your approximate posterior and the true posterior. So as long as you're a good Bayesian and you drive that KL to zero, then your regret will be optimal as well. Um, and that's kind of nice because it's sort of agnostic about how you make that KL small. So then you just turn, put on your Bayesian hat and you say, I'm going to do some fancy variational inference thing with a normalizing flow or a whatever, right? <laughs> whatever you choose. And if you can make that KL gap small, then you'll get, you'll inherit those optimality guarantees. That's a nice way of looking at it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, 
question from the audience so i had one other question again on behalf of the audience but let's say i'm talking i'm asking now on behalf of questions uh, of the audience who are let's say in their phd or doing master's research so when you presented the ideas they seem fairly obvious like they seem like oh this see, this should have been the case you should have used a low dimension projection or you should have used ekf or deep ensemble so all of these things seemed obvious but i'm sure that when starting out these would not have been obvious and maybe there were some other things you tried that didn't work out and and it seemed that you've borrowed some some very interesting insightful results from the other communities uh, so how do you suggest people learn that art of of looking at existing results and see how to best utilize them in your work yeah i mean everyone's looking for an angle um that's novel so that they can publish um and sometimes it's you know it can be a small i mean this idea is not particularly deep as you said <laughs> i and i i agree that's true i i think our gains um one of the, my motivations was that some of the other methods that people have used for bayesian neural bandits are really the, like the neural linear is quite simple and works quite well but some of the other methods which i didn't go over today um are quite complicated and don't really work very well in practice and so the the origin story for this particular line of work um it's kind of interesting so i was um writing up ekf in my book and you know most of the examples of state space models are you know things like tracking airplanes or you know the state of the economy or something like that or like medical applications uh, it's so it seems to be a very little known fact that you can use state space modeling for online bayesian inference of neural nets like that paper was published in 1989 but it isn't cited very much so like old people know it <laughs> but like no none of the new kids know it um you know people only ever do they've heard of variational inference but they don't know about anything else so uh, with harado who's one of my summer students we built a little demo applying mlps applying ekf to fit an mlp the demos online actually i can see if i can find the link um it's kind of cute it's a jax well we're actually rewriting it we have a new jax library for state space models um uh that will reimplement this but i think the old one should work let's see if i can find it um um yeah let me try let me this is kind of what's showing it's kind of fun All right so i'm presenting again i think um right so right okay so here's some the black dots are data points the red dots are the most recent observation and i'm fitting a 1d regression model to the data as the data streams in and you can see that um so initially the wiggly lines are samples from the posterior and they're all over the place and the blue is the posterior mean and you can see that it's converging pretty quickly um to the true function um and the you know the red dots are just i'm just sampling randomly in the input space and it's converging pretty fast but so um we repeat again. So this is kind of cool I thought. Um so this is just a you know literally a textbook example right. So this is not novel. This is the 1989 algorithm. So I was scratching my head trying to figure out how to make something like that scale. And I heard a talk um uh let's see if I can remember the name of the authors. Um I know Roseanne Liu was one of them. Um let's see if I can find it. The paper they were at Uber at the time. Yeah. Um Jason Yusinski uh and two other authors Lee and Farquhar. And so I heard some talk and she had this slide and showed that oh look you you don't need a million parameters for a neural net you only need like 100 if you do this random basis function trick. And I thought ah bingo we can use that trick to scale EKF. So I just took two things that were known and put them together and no one had thought of that combination and it was you know it worked. and um it worked sufficiently the gap relative to prior art was sufficiently large and the method is sufficiently simple um that uh it was accepted although you know the reviewers to be honest it was a borderline paper because they said there's no theory like most bandit papers have theory and so sure um so i think it's important to be motivated by a, a practical problem so the the bigger picture goal i had in my mind was trying to increase the sample efficiency of rl so we just started with bandits 
I mean, I gave this story about how we chose that particular method, but it sort of bothers me that RL um, really only works in simulation because it needs so much data. So we really need to be using model-based RL and we need the modeler uncertainty. And so this feels like a killer app for Bayes. Like if Bayes is gonna be useful, it surely should be useful here. So that's sort of my overarching research goal in, in this in, for this particular project. And this is just like a stepping stone to get there. Um, so, you know, if the paper hadn't gotten in, that's fine. Like we tried it, it worked, it's a cute idea. And then you extend it, right? There's all kinds of extensions I mentioned. Um, so I think if you're trying things, you should just believe in your ideas and you might, you will very often find that they've already been published. This happens to me like every week. I come up with, I think of something in the shower and oh, and then I Google it. And then five minutes later, I discover, you know, if I discover it was published last week, I don't feel so bad that like I say, well, at least I'm up to date. <laughs> like, it's not like I was scooped um, 10 years ago. If it's like 50 years ago, no one will remember. So <laughs> You can probably republish it and no one will know. Um, but uh, yeah, it just happens. You know, the field is crowded. And But I think I wouldn't focus so much on novelty for its own sake. I think if your idea is good, then you should really use it to do something that no one could do before, right? And, um, and then maybe methodologically, it's just a small twist, but it's like so much simpler, right? I mean, we were using off-the-shelf pieces. Like we literally, it's like five lines of code, this algorithm. If you have an EKF library that you can get from anywhere and we can sample and you can act readily. So you just like glue a little bit of flax code with a little bit of EKF code and, and there you go. Um, that's very appealing, right? If you actually want people to use your stuff in practice, then it's hard to publish simple methods, but they're usually the ones that people use. So you can have an impact via applications. Thank you for the insightful answer. I think one other thing which Kevin mentioned, which is uh, very important, and all of us have seen, would agree to some extent to agree to attend talks, especially some of sometimes which are outside your direct domain. Sometimes you end up picking up some very useful tidbits there. Other questions from the audience, the online audience? Oh, someone put something in chat. So please explain how JAX is different from other libraries. So, <laughs> um, so JAX is just a library on top of Python, right? Um, it's basically accelerated NumPy. Uh, and you can use it for neural net modeling if you use Flax, which is a library on top of JAX. Uh, so I think it's, you know, the main alternative would be PyTorch or, or maybe TensorFlow. Um, I think JAX is just simpler because it's very similar to NumPy and it's maps to the math quite directly. And it's particularly useful for problems that are not specific to neural networks. So if you want to, you know, do differential equations or state-space modeling or whatever, uh, it's, it's quite elegant for that. So scientific computing more generally. Um, but, you know, everything you can do in JAX, you can do it more or less you can do in PyTorch these days. They have a functional library that they just released. Um, and similarly in TensorFlow, so it's a question of taste. But um, Professor Bartra and I are a big Jax fans. It's it's very readable and it's quite efficient. I think, okay, I think we should, yeah, we should not hold you up further into your evening. So uh, th thank you. Thank you a lot, Kevin, for this insightful talk. We'll definitely take a lot of ideas and, uh, you know, you may see some papers from this set of set of people published somewhere picking up on the ideas you said. Uh, cool. let's, let's, all yeah. let's all thank Kevin again. Thank you. Great. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Not present here tomorrow. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I do have a time machine. Uh, in case. <laughs>
<laughs> in case you missed uh, yesterday so please talk to binita there's a goodie bag for everybody uh, please pick it up if you have not and i was a little disappointed with the attendance yesterday we did have a great session as everybody present here will tell you okay